Hi, I'm Sanjay Sadanti, and today I'm going to talk about running serverless web applications in Python. I got interested in this project a few months ago with the following question. Is it possible to deploy a web app to the internet and never have to maintain it again? I was working on a side project, and I knew about several ways to deploy web applications. On the one hand, I could rent a VM and start a server myself on it. But in my experience, those can go down sometimes, and I didn't want to have to maintain this. On the other hand, I could run my own cluster, which would be reliable, but it seemed like a lot of work. So in searching for a better solution, that's how I got started thinking about serverless. In this talk, I'm going to go over an introduction to serverless and specifically one offering called AWS Lambda. Most of the talk is going to be centered around building serverless web applications with a Python library called Zappa. And my goal for this talk is to try to convince you to use serverless, or at least give it a try if you haven't already. Serverless means a lot of things. It's really an umbrella marketing term. But what it means is that the cloud provider manages the servers and the scaling on your behalf. To be crystal clear, your code is still executing on a server somewhere. But the main difference is that you are no longer responsible for the server's lifecycle. I want to focus on one serverless offering in particular called AWS Lambda. Lambda is Amazon's serverless compute platform. It supports several runtimes out of the box, including Python, but also others like Go and Node.js. In Lambda, you write what's called a function, and your Lambda function can connect to persistent data stores, such as a database, an S3 bucket, or a shared file system. And one nice feature about Lambda is that you only pay for the compute time that you use, down to the millisecond. Lambda also has some basic limitations that are good to know about. First of all, everything times out after 15 minutes maximum on Lambda. So if you have a ro long running workload and you don't know how to split it up, then Lambda is probably not a good use case for you. Also in Lambda, you have very limited access to a file system. You only have access to a temp directory that's ephemeral. So I don't recommend using it for persisting data. However, as I said earlier, you can persist data by connecting to another persistent data store. And finally, managing sub-processes gets a little bit difficult with Lambda. You're welcome to spawn multiple processes or sub-processes if you want to, but you're not guaranteed that they'll finish executing unless your code waits for them to finish. Basically, what happens is as soon as the main process exits, your environment might be torn down. So you need to build that into your code to wait for any sub-processes to finish executing first. I think that serverless is potentially good for anybody who doesn't want to manage infrastructure. But specifically, there's a couple really natural use cases that we're going to focus on in this talk. The first is when you have a workload that needs to scale up rapidly, for short periods of time, and then sit idle for the rest of the day. In this case, it doesn't make sense to pay for a server just to sit idle all day, even though you're paying for it. Another natural use case is when you want to run a function, every time an item, like an HTTP request, enters a queue. So with these two insights, now that we see that serverless platforms allow really rapid scaling based on uh, incoming events, such as HTTP requests, I want to talk about running web applications on serverless. I feel that this topic is often neglected. And I think that serverless platforms provide us with really powerful tooling for running web apps. When I got started on this project, I thought it would be easy. But I ended up getting stuck with a lot of the mundane things, like how do you serve a front end 
or migrate a database or do things like that when you don't have a server around. In this talk, I'm going to share my experience of the problems I ran into and, and how I figured them out. While I can only talk about what I worked on, I do believe that this can be generalized to any Python backend and perhaps even beyond that. I want to first introduce a tool called Zappa, which is an incredibly useful Python library. It's open source, and it makes it so easy to deploy Python applications to Lambda with just a couple commands. Lambda expects a zip archive that uh, basically a zip file that has all of your code and all of your dependencies. And Zappa creates this archive for you, in addition to creating basically all of the AWS infrastructure that you need. All you need to get started is an AWS account. I want to review just a couple features to illustrate why I think Zappa is so great. The first one is how Zappa handles dependencies. So I told you just previously that uh, AWS Lambda expects a zip archive that includes your code and the code of all of your dependencies. So Zappa hooks into your virtual environment and automatically zips up all of the Python dependencies that it identifies. However, it has to do special handling for certain dependencies. Let's think about this. Many popular libraries, such as NumPy, for example, include compiled C code for performance. In fact, they might be mostly written in C with just a Python wrapper. When you run pip install NumPy, you're going to get the wheels for NumPy. And with those wheels come the compiled binaries for your current environment. In my case, I have a Mac. So I'm going to get the binaries that are compiled for Mac OS. This is going to be problematic because Lambda runs in a Linux environment. And these binaries are almost certainly not going to work on the Lambda runtime. So it's clear that if Zappa just hooked into my virtual environment on my Mac and zipped up everything it found naively, that would not work. To fix this, Zappa actually has a sister repository of very common Python libraries that use uh, compiled binaries. And when it is zipping up the dependencies, if it sees that you're using one of these libraries, such as NumPy, it will intelligently swap out the binaries for ones that are compatible with Lambda's runtime. This is a huge feature that just takes a lot of headache off of the developer. And I think that that deserves special attention. Another great feature about Zappa is that it has a built-in solution for fixing cold starts. So cold starts are one of the most common complaints about serverless functions. The idea is that if you don't invoke your function for a while, then the container, the Lambda container, will go cold. It'll disappear. And then the next time you try to invoke the function, you have to wait a few seconds for a new container to be provisioned. This might be OK for some use cases that aren't user facing. But for a web application, it's really not acceptable to keep the user waiting in the browser for several seconds while a new Lambda container is provisioned. So Zappa actually has a keep warm setting that periodically invokes the Lambda function every few minutes in order to keep the container warm. It's great to have this built in, and you don't really have to do anything to get it. So now that we know just a little bit about Zappa, again, this was not exhaustive, let's jump into how to use it. The most common use case is that you want to deploy your application code. Uh, this requires just a couple steps. First, you run pip install Zappa in your virtual environment. Once you do that, then you can run Zappa init. And this makes a Zappa settings.json file for you, as shown below. Um, and finally, you run Zappa deploy with this. Um, and once you have this JSON file around, when you run Zappa deploy, within about a minute, 
your backend code will be live on the internet running on AWS Lambda. Uh, so this is super fast. And then uh, let's get into more detail. Another use case that I think is important is to keep the build small. So uh, in my case, I had a repository that has Python code as well as a React.js front end. And I don't want any of that JS code or my node modules or anything like that to be clogging up this Zappa build that gets, that gets sent to Lambda. So you can use an exclude flag in the Zappa settings.json to exclude cert certain paths that uh, you don't want in the build. So uh, with the previous two slides, by running uh, Zappa deploy, uh, Zappa init and then Zappa deploy, we were able to get our backend running on the internet. But most backends don't exist in isolation. For example, most web apps will need to talk to other services, such as a database. And they'll need to store secrets in order to do this. For storing secrets, I think the easiest thing to do is to set them as secure environment variables in the Lambda console, as shown in this picture. So uh, you can set, for example, your database connection string or your database password here. Uh, and then you can just read it into your environment as you normally would. Another option, if you have more secrets and you want to manage them programmatically, is that you can write the secrets to a file in S3 and have your function read them at startup. So at this point, we've learned how to deploy a backend to Lambda and also get it access to a database. So the next question is, how can we actually migrate the database? When, when I initially did this, I thought about just spinning up an EC2 instance to run migrations on. But I think that defeats the whole purpose of not wanting to manage servers. I found a command called Zappa invoke that allows you to run any Python function from your application on Lambda in, in the runtime with all of your dependencies loaded up. So, uh, this is extremely useful because basically what we can do is run our migration function on Lambda. First, we need to get the right permissions to do that. So we need to configure Zappa so that it'll run, it'll tell our Lambda function to run in the right VPC with the right permissions. Again, Zappa has built in support for this. So you can add this uh, VPC config block to your Zappa settings.json. And this tells it to run the Lambda function in this subnet that I've created and attach this security group to it, which gives it access to talk to my database. Once you've done that and redeployed, then you can do a Zappa invoke um, and just give it the name of your migration function. In this case, actually, the function I'm showing is the one that creates the initial schema and tables for me. This is super useful. And um, I showed you how to use Zappa Invoke for migrating a database. But if you have any other uh, you know, infrequent commands that you'd like to run, and you don't know what to do because you don't have a server around to run them, you can use Zappa Invoke to run them in the environment where all the dependencies are loaded up. The next part that I wanted to talk about was how to serve a front end. First, I'll give a little bit of background. Outside of Lambda, it's a very common practice for a front end and back end to be served together on the same server. What, what typically is happening there is that you actually have two web servers. You have uh, what's called a reverse proxy web server, such as Nginx, um, that sits in front and is facing the internet. And this server is usually extremely fast and optimized at serving static files. So when you get requests for your static files, that server handles it automatically. And then for any other requests, it's actually forwarding them to your Python WSGI web server. 
which is relatively slower than the something like Nginx, uh, but it'll handle all of your uh, dynamic requests. On Lambda, the issue is that we don't have as much control over the web server. So it's harder, it's not impossible, but it's harder to give special treatment to static files. So that leaves us with two good options. The first option is to try to serve the static assets directly through the Python code. My concern originally was that this might be very slow. Typically, Python is not great for serving things like static assets, and you'd be better off with another tool. However, I have seen some interesting libraries, including one called White Noise, that try to optimize your application to make it much faster for this use case. Or the other option is to simply use an external service like Amazon S3 or CloudFront uh, for serving the static assets. Either of these options should be completely fine, but I went with option two because it's clean, it's easy, and it's very performant. There are already lots of guides on the internet for how to serve static files through S3, so I'm not going to repeat them here, but I will focus on a couple areas that I got tripped up on. The first one is about uh, server-side rendering. So server-side rendering is a common optimization that's used to make single-page applications more SEO-friendly and faster for the initial page load. Typically what's happening is that single page applications send the client a JavaScript bundle, and that bundle creates the HTML for the application on the client side. The problem is that not all web crawlers can execute JavaScript code. So if you have an application that's exclusively rendered on the client side, then when your web crawler comes around and it tries to index your site, if it can't execute the JavaScript, all it's going to see is a really bare bones index.html that just says load up app.js. This means that, again, if your website is exclusively rendered on the client side, it'll struggle with search engine optimization because uh, the web crawlers just won't be able to index all of the content uh, for your website. So, People solve this uh, in various ways, but a very common optimization is server-side rendering, which means that we'll render some or all of the HTML on the back end and send it to the client. That means that when the web crawler comes around, it now sees a fully populated index.html, and there's a lot of content that can be indexed. Now, as I said, we have to execute JavaScript code on the back end in order to uh, render the HTML for server-side rendering. So this usually requires a Node.js backend that can execute JavaScript code. However, it's not always the case. It is possible, and I've seen, ex I've seen an example of doing server-side rendering with a Python backend. Uh, it's a library called Python React, and how it works is that from the Python code, it spawns React.js processes, uh, they're called render servers, that will execute the JavaScript code and render HTML. The issue is that I don't know if, it, if Lambda gives you enough control to set this up. I told you before that you can definitely manage multiple processes and subprocesses on Lambda, but it's a, a little bit more work. So I would say proceed with caution here if you need server-side rendering and you also want to use a Python backend with Zappa. Um, there might be a path forward, but I'm not sure. The other area I got confused about initially was client-side routing. So client-side routing is another common optimization that's used to prevent full page reloads as the user navigates throughout the site. With, when you're doing static web hosting in S3, client-side routing works as expected until the user hits refresh or until they reload the page. Uh, 
and then it breaks if you're not on the home page. The reason is, let's say you're on a page called foo.html, and and the the user hits refresh. The browser is going to go looking for an asset, a static asset called foo.html, which ob obviously does not exist. There are many ways to solve this problem. Uh, so a quick Google search could do it. But the absolute most simplest one is to tweak a setting in the S3 static web hosting configuration and set the error document to index.html. This means that if it can't find the asset that it was looking for, it'll fall back to fetching index.html again. So at this point, uh, we just did a very quick 20-minute um, overview of how to deploy a Python backend on Lambda, connect it to a database, migrate that database, and serve a front end that is also connected to all of that code. So we basically have a full stack web application running, and we never had to manage a single server throughout that process. I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about debugging. Initially, I was worried about the debugging experience with the serverless application, but I actually found it to be very easy. If you're using Zappa, your logs are automatically going to CloudWatch, or you can run Zappa tail to tail the logs. You can also configure an exception handler to send uncaught exceptions to Sentry or whatever your error monitoring tool is. So all of this was very easy to work with. The only thing was I wanted to offer one word of caution about timeouts. So I told you earlier that uh, Lambda has a maximum timeout of 15 minutes for any function. However, Zappa, for whatever reason, Zappa's default is to timeout if a function doesn't return any output within 30 seconds. The Zappa timeout messages are generic and easy to miss. So if you start seeing weird behavior, it's possible that something timed out and you didn't notice it. For example, I saw a post on Stack Overflow about how someone's migration script takes longer than 30 seconds to run. They were running it using Zappa Invoke, like I showed you, and Zappa timed it out. And this was not apparent to that person until much later when they were seeing lots of unexpected bugs and behavior. I also wanted to talk just for a couple minutes about what Docker users should do with Zappa. So I personally really like developing in Docker containers. They're portable, and I have the assurance that my development environment is going to be exactly the same as the production environment. And this is a huge peace of mind for me. Related to this, I um, was initially kind of bummed that it didn't look like I could use Docker if I also wanted to use Zappa. Um, and I have a couple gripes, actually, about Lambda and Zappa. So as I mentioned earlier, Zappa does this special handling of dependencies with compiled binaries. It, it curates a sister repository of popular Python packages that use binaries, and um, it, it does it basically by hand curating that list. The problem is that you might eventually find yourself using a dependency that it ships with binaries, but that dependency didn't make Zappa's list. And at that point, you're going to wish you had a, a better development environment because I don't think Zappa's solution will be sufficient. So, um, so I recommend using the Zappa Docker image. This is a Docker image that exactly replicates the Lambda runtime environment. And if you use it as your base image and do everything else the same, I think you'll be in good shape. And you'll never have this problem of ending up with binaries that are compiled for the wrong architecture. In conclusion, who should use Zappa? I think Zappa is 
a fantastic tool for individuals or small teams that want to focus on application code instead of managing infrastructure. It is just a huge improvement in velocity to have a tool that manages all of the infrastructure for you, manages horizontal scaling, and has a lot of features built in, especially in the early stages of a project um, when, when you just want to focus on, on velocity on the actual application. Also, for me personally as an individual, for a side project, Zappa was a dream come true. If nobody pings my web app for the next year, and then all of a sudden a year from now, people start using it, it should probably still be there. And I'll have paid almost nothing for compute in the meantime. I will admit that at scale, cost becomes a consideration. and some, doing something like managing a cluster probably still makes sense. I also wanted to briefly talk about what else is out there and what to look for in the serverless space going forward. There's another open source Python library called Chalice. This one's actually developed by Amazon Web Services. The idea of Chalice is it's supposed to make it extremely easy to develop um, Python web apps on Lambda. However, I personally found Chalice difficult to use. The issue is that unlike Zappa, where you can take an existing Flask or Django application and just run it on Zappa, with Chalice, you actually have to change a lot of your code to make it work. And this just created too high of a barrier to entry for me personally. I didn't want to be locked in to using Lambda. I wanted to have the option to run my Flask or Django application using a normal web server or also try out Lambda. And I think that's something that Zappa got totally right. The other two offerings from Google and Amazon, respectively, are serverless um, container-first um, offerings. So they're called Google Cloud Run and AWS Fargate. Both of them make it very, very easy to run any arbitrary Docker container, which I think is really powerful. And in my experience, these have been extremely easy to use. I think that as containerized technologies get more and more popular, so will these offerings. And finally, I've given this talk before and I got some good questions. So I wanted to close by answering those questions with the last couple of minutes. The first question is, how is WSGI used with Zappa? This is a good question. So I'm sure most of you heard, have heard of WSGI. It stands for Web Server Gateway Interface. And it's the interface that's used for Python web applications to communicate with web servers. Basically, the, the core thing that makes Zappa work is that it's a shim that converts Amazon API gateway syntax into WSGI. So what that means is that when you get a new HTTP request uh, coming in through Amazon API Gateway, Zappa is actually going to convert that gateway request into WSGI so that your application can interpret it and then return WSGI back. Um, so, so that's how WSGI is used here. Um, it's a bit of a hack, but it's quite neat, and Zappa makes it work very well. Second question is, how does Keep Warm work? And does it become expensive uh, if you're having to keep a server warm? So actually, what Keep Warm is doing is it's keeping your Lambda container warm. That's the container that when, when you request a certain number of resources, um, you're allocated a container that's isolated and kept separate from other people's applications. Keep warm works. Uh, this is the Zappa keep warm setting. It works via a scheduled CloudWatch event that uh, pings your Lambda function every four minutes. But it's important to note that this doesn't mean you're paying for a server all the time. With Lambda, you actually just pay for the number of milliseconds of compute time that you use. You don't pay for keeping a container up all the time. So. Um, by executing these ping functions every four minutes, uh, 
these are extremely, extremely fast. And in my experience, add almost no noticeable cost to the bill, given that your compute time is actually going to be dominated by your application, not by some ping function. And the final question is, is Zappa scalable? And the answer is yes, it's extremely scalable. That's one of the main ideas is that horizontal scaling is built in. In theory, no request will ever time out because um, each one, each request can get its own uh, Lambda function. You can keep running more and more Lambda functions side by side. And AWS takes care of that horizontal scaling on your behalf. So in theory, it can scale up almost infinitely. So thank you so much for listening to my talk. I hope you learned something, and I hope that I convinced you to give a serverless offering a try. And if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to follow me on Twitter, and I'm happy to answer them there. Thank you.